What's up, everybody? This is Doug Jenkins here with Freddie DeMarco. We just received a session, and we are doing a full-blown stem session in this studio. It's one of the most powerful things you can do to a mix when you don't have all the hardware that a lot of studios have. So what we're going to do is we're going to go one by one into these, these tracks and how we're processing, talk about signal flow a little bit, about how the gear and what it's doing to the signal, and therefore what you're going to get out of it. What is the benefit of hardware? What's the, what's the benefit of mixing this way? So it's going to be pretty fun. We have a screen capture going on, so you're going to get to see the Pro Tools session, a few cameras set up so you get to see the actual gear in use, and I'm going to do my best to go one by one down these. So we'll start in the Pro Tools rig, and we're going to, we're going to see what we got here. So the session had, um, if we go to the mix window in Pro Tools, you're going to it still has the active of what our stem channels are. So to give you a little rundown on what the actual signal flow is, in this studio there is, what is it, 32 channels of links? Uh, yeah, 32, and then we got four more coming that we're utilizing from the Omni. Okay. And uh, our 192, that's dedicated just to headphones. Okay. We are clocking everything uh, through an analog clock, and then the 10M as okay. well. So, so that's... The signal flow so now what we did in the studio so Freddie and myself we got together and we actually normaled a lot of these these uh, signals so the normal signal actually goes through this left rack so the first converter you're gonna see on screen is B1 B1 is corresponding to 273 EQ1 all the way down so one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and how many channels uh, we have 12 of just these. Okay, so 12 channels. So if you do a stem session, we can actually take, and I'll show you here on screen, if you follow the mouse, B1 is our output from our Lynx converter. The Lynx converter then feeds over to the input B1, and that is actually out Lynx in 273. So now you have 273, you have the EQ, you have everything you need right there. And then inside the 273, there's an insert point, which has a universal audio 76. So, so the signal path goes converter, which is corresponding to B1 in Pro Tools. B1 out feeds the input back, so that's our return track, which is an audio track. And that is being hit by a 76 EQ on a 273 and then we have all that control that amplification from the actual 273 the EQ the output trim which is really really important by the way and the 76 in line so that's how this works so if I solo this up you're gonna hear what's going on with this kick drum It's pretty cool though, so we're lighting those two up up here. Yeah, so essentially we actually had to do a replacement on this, so we have two kick drum channels. So the two kick drum channels are actually using as a crossover. One's dedicated to more um, the high end and one more to the low end. We're running them through two separate uh, channels and two separate types of compression and then we are actually stemming that out to two tracks right now because we don't know that we want to commit but we could make that into one track if we wanted to and then what happens is over the course of all these we're going to treat all this stuff with all different types of hardware and at the end of it we'll, we get rid of the initial channels and then we have just the treated channels and we can mix from then utilizing um, EQs and so forth in the box. However, sometimes when we do this, we do mix in the box at times, yeah. like like mixing with the outboard here. Sometimes <clears throat> we'll notch, use an EQ inside to notch or an R base or something to add to um, what we're doing with the compression and the preamps and EQs that are all outboard here. So, so all the the whole thing we want you guys to see is yes, these were these were trigger drums. The trigger drums are going through. An, an obvious trigger software there's a lot of trigger software out there but we're finding a sound Freddie you know sculpted the sound in the way he wanted it the way he wanted these kicks to to complement the song and you'll see as we on solo everything um, but yeah it's, it's a really cool way to do it and like he was saying when you do a stem session you aren't 
the best way to describe it is you're not stuck with a two channel mix. I see this happen a lot. I see guys go, man, I, I wish I could have just maybe did something a little different or I want to, you know, redo this or redo that. When we can, when you have this kind of gear in this amount, you can actually do these multi-track and you can send them back to the artist and then they have something that they can always refer back to. So that's a really good way and a really good reason to do this. So we have the kick drum. We also did it to the snare drum. Most of the drums are the 273s from Warm. So if you go down here as we solo, here's the snare tracks. These are going through three and four in the 273 rack. And then that's hitting an actual 76 here, right? Yeah, the two warm audio 76s. So kick kick is up here on the UA one, snare is going through the universal go audio. Right, right? Yeah, we so. And uh, the top head, and then there was a, a bottom head. We messed with it a lot. We ended up settling on two separate samples. Now, yep. normally we'd love to just keep the live drums and mix them in with samples or not even use samples. In this particular case, for whatever reason, we're going with samples. So we have two samples working together with different EQs, different compressions. <laughs> Yeah. back into Pro Tools. Yeah, so then once you print that back in, then you always have that printed track. So it, it's a really great way of doing it. So if we go back to the mix window, now we've done this through the whole entire session, so you see what this is all about, and we want you guys to really get a, get a feel for what a STEM session is. You're going into the room, so now you have the room, and you really hit this room, right? We sent that room uh, into one of the channels. Uh, we did a massive low end, right here, a massive low end roll off on this. And we went to a four button move right here on a 76 style compressor. So we're crushing it. Um, not juicing the input too much. I don't want total distortion, but a very misbehaving, aggressive sound that can be refined EQ wise and then mixed into the aggressive guitars and aggressive bass and hopefully make sense and agree with the other instruments. So, so let's just listen. So aggressive. Let's listen to that, man. <laughs> let's on solo. Let's do it the long way. <laughs> so here's the uh, the room. Now we got our monitors down because we're trying to track. Here's you want to hear the original room? Let's yeah, let's let's show them the original everything really. Original room. D5. Same level. Now for the mix purpose, it's a little bit lower. But on most of these, even though we're being aggressive, we will level match. Um, in regards to the recording level. So the Snare. idea with a stem session is when you put everything uh, to unity gain, yeah. it should just have your, your stem mix and then you, you go from there. So with the room, if you put that in context with the drum kit, with the song, we actually turn the level down for the, for the purpose of the mix. It's insane, man. <laughs> so we have, let's see here, kick, snare, rooms. So let's go, let's go all the way back to the beginning here. Let's on solo everything and let's let's listen to the original. How about that? So let's listen to the original drum kit. Now I'm gonna have to do some routing, but that's all right. Um, let's go back to the mix window. So here's the original kick. I'll just have to remember where I was at. No biggie, man. Original kicks. So that's what we have. Just basically a triggered sample. I mean, There's really, a, really 8 bitty doesn't sound... I mean, you go ahead and explain Well, that. the thing is, if you send us a kick drum, we're going to definitely tailor it off your kick drum. You know, a lot of times I'll discuss with the client, say, do you, they'll say, no, do whatever you think. Sometimes they'll say, no, it's got to be that kick, but I want some samples around it. I want uh, a, a richer low end. I want a little more click on the high. And we'll still maintain the integrity of the actual kick in this case they're just triggered sound so it's up to us so it's basically we're making a drum machine going across this we're yeah. not using much 
live. Um, and we tried. We tried to use the under snare, and the client's gonna is happy with doing it this way. So, so um, let me bring them in with the drumagog so you can hear that real quick. Yeah. Now, as we take it over to B1 and 2, that would be our summing out to our 273s, 1 and 2, and this is what you get. There's an intended boxy sound in there because we didn't want too perfect of a sample. We want a little bit of that boxy, misbehaving sound, and that's surrounded by a nice high and a nice low coming from a different sample. So. Uh, it's awesome. I mean, to me, it's night and day. Yeah, it sounds real, oh, yeah. So what we're going to do here is same thing with the snare drum. If you look at output one and two on the snare, we'll take off the, the trigger software. And here was the snare drum right here. snare and we still may use some of that original snare mixed in there for some some realism no and that's a good point because there's actually a way to add the wet with the dry and it's almost like a parallel and when he sent us this mix he had multiple auxiliaries bringing depth to the instruments and and that gives us a real understanding of what he was looking to accomplish in the mix i mean if you're trying to add compression add parallel add this stuff you're trying to get a better sound out of your instrument you know so what freddie said is absolutely correct if you if you start to add some of that original signal back in and now you're adding that you always have that though that's what's so great about a stem session you can always go back to the original snare and say hey look I want to blend some of that as the artist. So that's what's so cool about it. You and know? in this case, Drumagog itself will have a wet dry. I could actually bring some in right on a Drumagog channel, right as we speak, even. So, yeah, the workflow's quick. That's the whole thing about setting this up and the rewiring and everything we did. Everything's geared so we could just work quick and, and move as our creativity's moving. We're not yep. held up with anything. Um, that certainly makes time go well when we're, we have pain sessions and everything, yeah. but also as a workflow. The other thing that's going on here the big macro view of all this the reason we're excited about the stems is we have it set up where we could stem through so many things and actually build an entire mix because if you just start taking for example one stereo compressor and EQ and EQ each thing individually you're really not hearing it all together because we'll go back and make some pretty yeah. serious tweaks we get the heat and the feel of the analog going but then we might have to get a little more surgical so you want to hear everything together. That is the advantage of running the whole mix, and then we print all those stems at once. I think all we did for this purpose is do this to just the instrumental. Yeah, and we just did it to the instrumental. We started to get the, the stuff up. I was excited about the video and showing everybody on YouTube, and it was just like, okay, let's get this going, because this studio has the capability of doing that. A lot of studios don't have the capability. They don't have the channel count. They don't have... They don't have the channel count at all. They don't have the, the channel strips. And if you have one or two of these, you can do the same thing at home. But like Freddie said, having it in context is a big deal. Because you can hear, eh, maybe I should have done this a little bit different, or I should have done that a little bit different. And just having that and then printing it, you know? That's... Right, because you may have too, high, too much high end on a snare that's really fighting with the high end uh, metal style guitar. There's a certain fizz up there and something's fighting. We need to adjust something. It's good to still go back before we print and adjust it from the hardware and make it all agree then hit it and then you still have your whole mix in the box to mess with after that point so so we'll keep going I'll skip some of these because we got a lot more to cover but the snare drum now drumagog now going back through the 273s this is what they sounded like and you'll understand why that was done here in a minute Room back in. I'll just start sawing these out. We don't have to go one yeah, by one through toms, these. Yeah, the toms, we kept what they had. We just did some EQing. We ran them through the uh, British style EQs and pre's. And uh, overheads, we ran through a 2500 bus compressor and did a little bit of notch filk EQing 
in the box on those. So I didn't even, we didn't even use an outboard. A lot of times we'll use uh, the Poltec style or the tube style EQs or even we'll run overheads through Manly box boxes here. Yeah, can you see we, those? For this right now, we had a real high-end fizz we had to deal with. We went in the box and found that and kind of corrected that and then brought forward the sound uh, actually with the preamp and the compressor. So now we have, okay, so the overheads, I know we did a little bit of work on those. That's what I was just yep. talking about. Okay. Yep. All right, I was thinking about the base. And that here. room fits right into those overheads. Okay. You know, that room with the four button. So let's Move see, let's see what the whole thing's sounding like awesome. in context so they can actually hear it. Yeah, man. That's, that's great. So here we go. So now you're into the bass. Same principle. Um, eight and nine. Now that would be over here, 273. <clears throat> and then this returns here. Here's your bass. So real quick, on your high-end bass, you want to mute the other one. We have a crossover situation. We just copied it, duplicated the channel. I got a certain type of comp compression, certain type of roll off and EQ happening because this needs to agree with the fat end of it. And let's go in here, just that. The just lower, the fat. Yeah, the lower end. Right. And that's putting a little bit of weight, a little bit of puff in there, and then the punch from the top end. And we'll adjust just that. Snap it a taste. little. Yeah, it's snapping a little. But sometimes that sounds good with the way it's kicking with the kick drum, getting a little extra attack. That's another big deal, actually, when you have a really nice converter. The headroom on the converter, the way that it works with your system, it makes a difference. So, you know, a lot of people, the converter matters, and I do a lot of videos on the YouTube channel about that. I think you guys have seen some of those. But the Lynx has this natural, really nice headroom to them. It's smooth sounding. It's it almost feels like as if you're working with a two inch tape machine. Right. You could hit it a little bit harder. And that doesn't necessarily do and compress and saturate and get the tape pressure sound, yeah. but it's forgiving. When you're at the end of a mix and you're yeah. running a little out ahead, rather than rebuilding the whole mix, they could take a little more hit and that really helps the workflow out to not have to yeah. regain stage things. Yeah, so sometimes you're actually fighting that last stage because of the gear. And you're like, man, I just can't get any more out of it. And that was just something to, you know, make note of. Now, you did the uh, the guitars that were actually printed, right? He had these sort of printed the way he wanted them. Um, we found DIs, clean DIs, okay. but it seems like he already amp farmed those or did something to those. And, and, and when you really listen to what he had as a plug-in, and then take the plugins off. You could hear what he first wanted in the amp. You hear where he was going with it with the EQ. We stripped all that, went to outboard EQs, and ran them through what I love for uh, distorted guitars. These three A's. Now we're com we were compressing not quite to minus three. We weren't using it so much for the compression because distortion is natural compression. Yeah. But there's a tone to these and a punch in, in the leveling amplifier that almost is like a second amplifier just punching coloring the sound that way in a great way but there is yet some compression on those well and, let's uh, let's hear them. these before how about that yes yeah, so here's the before <laughs> You get the gist of it now we go back once again now this is routing so the way that we had to route this was patch bay um so d3 would be corresponding to the la3a left um d4 would be la3a right now are we hitting the board as well yeah we it, are and it's okay. what i call the rocky cues um i i cut my teeth on the giant trident series 80 board uh, Malcolm Toff was part of that design. He has his own boards now, but these pre's and EQ's are very much, especially the EQ, would be the same voicing of what was on the Series 80. So I got into that because I liked them. Plus, since there's so much different color, we have more refined, um, you know, certainly the Manleys and the API type stuff, the more American sound, but the British sound we combine with the, the, the Neve style and some actual Neves with this more trident toff sound i call these my rock eqs and since those were heavy guitars i'm touching shaping them with those eqs uh they definitely are hitting hitting the board sound mixed with the three a's and we kind of just i tried to do in a, a less shrill way what he had going on already in the box and it's like this is what it sounds like <laughs> Thank you. 
The first thing I noticed is there's an insane amount of space now. Mm -hmm. um, the way those things work are incredible. It, it's like you have what I heard prior. Let me go back because this is, this is important. Listen to how much space this takes up before you did what you're doing there. It's incredible. So this is before again. Yeah, I, was, I knew there was. It's just got this. It's got this where Freddie took care of that. Okay, so three and four. It does. It's a little bit of work, but man, it's worth the work. We do this. Well, it's quite the a bit. way somebody can get all this heat onto their yeah. track. Yeah. You know, the output. Oh, yeah. Totally different. And when we were EQing that, we were thinking of the issue we have with the high end cymbals to try to make that work better. We tried to get some high end fizz on the guitar, just enough to work with the cymbals. But then, voice, you know, there's some lead guitars and harmony guitars. I made those more throaty. So we didn't compress those. You had a lot of distortion, but we ran them through our rock EQs, our, yep. our uh, toss right out EQs. Here. And we made them more throaty. We did some low, uh, some high passing, cut some lows on that, and made more of a throaty or mid range so they sat right but still maintaining the aggressive nature of right. the guitar. But you couldn't have everything fizzing in the same frequency because they're all guitars. So now here's the fuzz you had. So this guitar. Yeah. Now let's find a part where that's playing. And we cued those. I'm gonna, That's I'm gonna, four guitar tracks, two of the originals and then two of one that I called Fuzz. I'm sure he's not thinking of them that way, but they had a, a certain type of shine on top of them. So here's those originals with the stemmed ones. They get buried. Um, they just sound really, really, really buried. So let's just do where you were at here. It's just an amazing once you, you have this, the sum of all of them together how much easier the mix is, it's it's incredible. The solo. Now, now the last guitar is the solo. Um, you actually, we just ran those to three tracks on the top, right? Yeah, no, uh, no um, compression there. Okay. But EQing, trying to make them agree with those other four guitar tracks. Let's listen to those. And then we'll put it all in context and sort of sum it all up. <laughs> Summing, no pun intended. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow, yeah. You gotta have fun, up. man. You're gonna sum have fun. It up. fun. Sum it up, man. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna have um, these guitars come in at the end here. It's incredible if you listen to these. Uh, these ones, you did a lot of EQ on those, didn't you? I made them throatier. Took I, I, I boxed them in an area where they could cut through and we didn't have to ruin the integrity and bury too much of the rhythm guitar. Let's hear these. I know they were panned, so let's try to do what they were. Yeah, there's a certain pan for them. So we're back into this, so we got back to the, the guitars. Now, let's listen to it in context, and I want to go through this very briefly. When you have so much gear on the mix, what, ends, what tends to happen, okay, this is a really busy track. This is a track that was recorded, I believe, at home, okay? This is, this is something that we didn't track, and it was sent. And this is what you can send to us, whether you're in the rock genre, the hip-hop genre, um, whatever genre it is. We can take this mix and you can give us strict direction and say, hey, I, I like the tone of this, I like the tone of that. And you don't know how important it is to say stuff like that in the mix. 
because then we know what you're talking about. Okay, I like the tone of this, or I like the tone of that. Now, if you don't know what you like the tone of, it is really beneficial to actually hear equipment and hear what this equipment can do. Um, a rack of, what they say about like a 273, for example, when you have multiple 273s across the mix, there is a natural space that starts to take shape that I don't know if it's gonna translate in the video as well as it translates through these speakers. And what happens is, is you actually naturally get dynamics and you get this image that is hard to come by, which I think the reason we still use analog gear to this day, it sounds natural, it sounds real, it sounds lifelike. So if I put this all back into context with, let's just start with the drums. Let's start with the, the kick print, the snare print, and I'll show you how this prints real quick. I think we got pretty much the gist of it, right, Freddie? Yeah, yeah, for the music end of it. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, instrumental end of it. We'll then, we'll then attack the vocals after this. Yeah, so the overheads, and we're going to light it all up. So this would be the drum kit, drum swell we had in here. Now add the bass. Guitars. Let's go to that part. So this would be everything. Okay, so now before the video ends, I'm gonna go back through. I'm gonna save this because we're still working on this session. But I'm gonna go back through and set them all back before any gear, before anything. Now, you can take over and talk while I'm over here doing the, the manual work if you want. Yeah. Because <laughs> I think this would be great to show everybody um, before we get out of here. No, so, so you have, you'll have two, two schools of thought. You'll have the critique of what we're doing here. You know, it would sound, you know, more uniform if it was on one council, like one giant big council. Well, sure, if you could mix on an SSL, that would be wonderful, but they still mix to outside EQs, tube EQs, tube compression, and all that. So um, the scrutiny, that's one school of thought. The other school of thought is... Well, don't worry about all the waveforms and everything coming from all from that that board all being the same because the reality is they're going outside anyways to other pieces of gear and things are recorded with different gauges of guitar strings, different amplifiers, different everything. So, so my philosophy that I, I take on and, and some of the people I follow. Uh, they use a lot of outboard gear, and that school of thought is, well, now we can offer different types of British colored preamps and EQs, uh, tube style EQs, all different types of compression, stereo bus compressors, um, API EQ, so, so the American sound versus the British tone, and there is a difference, and among all the gear, there's a difference, uh, and we could use different different pieces in conjunction with each other like sometimes i'll run two eqs we'll be able to actually run an eq off the board mixed with a pole textile eq so because of this we're able to tack tackle most almost any style uh, most types of instruments and vocals but also just for like a simple rock session um, we can give different types of color, give a certain color to the drums, a certain color to the guitars, utilizing different pieces, favorite gear that we have for those pieces. Um, and we also do a thing where we'll call it the, uh, what do we call it, the, uh, the chef's choice. A lot yeah. of times people just don't know. They'll say, you know, I'd like to hear a snare, um, give me a snare with a lot of compression from a 76. Someone else might like, hey, I want to hear it uh, with a two-way. We'll do all that, and then sometimes they'll say, we just don't know. And then we'll take it over because we're hearing everything in the room and we'll give them something that we think. And that's called the chef's uh, Yeah, choice. that's a good way and, to do and, it. And a lot of times they'll get that track back and mix and match that stuff. Well, so, you've had yeah. artists come to the studio and they'll sit in and uh, one that comes to mind to me is is these box boxes. It was like, eh, I don't want to, I just want to keep it in the box. It was really funny. You remember this? Yes. Well, it, so it's keep it in the box because there's a certain sound. And actually it's almost like you're scared that it's going to do something like especially for like edm or pop or something like i don't want that 
And uh, this gentleman I'm talking about, he heard the Vox Box, and now he puts the Vox Box on everything. So, you know what I mean? It, it's like, I, I just want, that's that's the sound. And, and with your studio, the yeah. porticos and stuff, and even here, sometimes, yeah. just running through the links and the 10M and the clock and everything, yeah, we can do difference. a pure bounce like that. We don't have to hit any of this gear. We can go digital right into the computer, uh, right, um, converters right down to Pro Tools. And sometimes a session's as simple as that. People yep. just wanted us yep. to run their system. Yeah, just stem it flat. Out. I've done just that with the it. SSL, too. The SSL, a guy says, hey, Doug, I just need it to sound. I just want the SSL. There's a bus compressor, SSL summing, done. And no change in the volume, no change in anything. It was just all SSL. And so I did get this routed back. So we're going to hear the original yeah, real let's quick. Check let's check it out. So what I, the first thing I noticed is this pillowy sound of the drum kit. The the drums disappeared to the back wall. Um, the guitars, obviously, we pushed them, so we probably changed his volume, you know, in all respect to him. But, yeah, the image that the three A's gave to the guitars, second to none. I, I love those things. Um, I don't personally own them. Freddie owns those. And when I first heard those, I was, you know, you kidding me? So those things are great. Um, the Manly Very Mute, we could have put that on the overhead bus and, and sort of you know calm that down a little bit we have the api 2500 running on that on the overheads um just the eq and all the stuff he was mentioning earlier in the video but if you listen real quick it sounds boxed it almost sounds canned um the recording and that's the difference that happened from before and after so it's it's an incredible difference when we're listening to there's a pair of focals jbls and ns10s in here but each one that's another thing monitors are huge in this so the NS10s are really good at that mid-range and understanding what it's going to translate when it goes to like television, when it goes to smaller systems. Do you got too much snare? Do you got you know too little you know snap on the kick or too much bass on the kick? And those are great for that. They're you know they're actually one of the best you can get for that very purpose. The Focals are like a flat with a little more bass response. Um, they go to about 40 hertz. And then the JBLs are more of a, I mean, those got a lot of beef in them. Well, and then the matching. Sub. Oh, and we you can, have the sub. That's why I'm what's hearing the beef. going beat. on. If something's more sub-oriented, cinematic, hip-hop, we, we, we can hear what's going on. Down yeah, there. so the monitoring and just having, you know, having this access, um, just reach out to us. Just reach out and see what if, if we can help you with your project. We'd love to do it. We love doing it. So. Yeah. It's good awesome. stuff, and we just wanted to give you just a quick rundown of it. That's just like a little taste of what what really goes on in here, and it's we actually enjoy doing this. And this is these are just the stems. This is isn't the mix. So when you're hearing the levels, we're not concerned with levels or even panning that much. It's more or less just showing you the stem, the yep. difference in the stems. Well, my name's Doug Jenkins. This is Freddie Demarco. Thanks and for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for for watching what we do in here. So we'll see you guys.